Irish paddler Sam Curtis joins us now in studio. Sam, how are things? Not too bad at all. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming in. So uh, we wanted to chat a little bit about you, about your sport, about the funding you get and things like that. And I think the best thing to start off with is kind of an explainer to some people who wouldn't know you, uh, what the K1 slalom canoe is, because we'll have all watched it in the Olympics, but you know it's been two years now since a lot of people will have watched yeah. the event. So uh, explain to us what you do. So I paddle K1, which is the single kayak men's. Then there's also the C1, which is canoe men's. So I'm sitting in a boat with a double-bladed paddle and going down, going down a slalom course like that. Mm. How long have you been doing it for? I have been doing it for... I've been canoeing for 12 years now. I've been racing seriously for about 8 or 7. So you're from Dunboyne in County Mead. I'd imagine, I dare say that there's a lot of places in Ireland where you can't exactly pop out and just participate in the sport. So how did you get into it? My older brother actually started, a friend of his up the road started, and I wasn't doing anything. Well, I was doing football, but I was rubbish at it. So I just did that instead, and I just, I really took to it. I just really started enjoying it. And then did a Talent ID day with Owen Reinish, and just kind of, and again, just started coming up well through that. So just stuck to it then. Yeah, so where do you go to train? Where do you go to actually get into this uh, as a young kid looking to get into the sport? So depending on, you, you'd generally go to Canoeing Ireland, and you'd kind of just start, you wouldn't start straight into slalom. You'd just start learning your basic skills, like the same way you wouldn't go straight into sprinting you just kind of go for a run you go to canoeing Ireland you learn your basic skills and then various clubs or the Canoe Slalom Ireland's actually development squad would pick you up then and how many clubs do we have in Ireland I wouldn't know exactly there's yeah. there's there, there's like a good few clubs they're very like they're very spread out across the country but again slalom being a very like high-end one there's very few it's a real Dublin centered kind of sport really sure. yeah Dublin centered and presumably as well, like everybody likes to do as much of their training as possible in Ireland, but I presume for you, actually getting abroad is sometimes a necessary step. Oh, it, it's 100% necessary. Just the standard of whitewater that we race on, we, like we race down a whitewater course, the standard of that we just don't have in Ireland. And you just have to get away to, uh, you have to get away to train on that so you're on par with what everyone else is doing. So you're, when you're looking for a whitewater course, it's obviously more rapids, things like that. Obviously, we've got a lot of still water in Ireland. So yeah. uh, like it's, it's unfortunate, isn't it? Like we've got plenty of different rivers and all that sort of stuff, but a lot of them just probably aren't fast enough for somebody yeah. to qualify for the Olympics. Well, at the moment, nearly every course we race on is artificial, it's man-made, so it's okay. purpose-built for slalom. So so my, my mentality of it is in Ireland we don't have that, but we have flat water rivers. Sure. That I can say I have if I have a river I can get on my boat and I can train hard and there's no excuse for me not to be as fit as everybody. And then when I go away, I can hone those technical skills. Okay, I see. That's very interesting. We'll come back to that as well when it comes to, to man-made uh, courses and things like that. But we do want to actually show some of the footage. This is one of the World Cup events. Uh, I think we might show Krakow, which was uh, one of the World Cup events. This is Krakow, right? This is Krakow, yeah. So uh, talk us through this. What are you thinking? Uh, well, this, this, was, this was actually one of my, my, best, uh, my best runs this season. It, I was barely outside of the qualification standard that I need for the Olympics and as well barely outside of the semi-final, which was a goal. Right. So essentially, it's, it's racing down again an artificial course, as you can see here, and it's about 22 gates, uh, 18 of those gates roughly. You go downstream, so you go with the current, and then as just happened there is an upstream gate, so you're coming back against the current in the six of them in a run. Okay, so is this the same course that you would get all over the world considering it's artificial? Is there a standard sort of World Cup slash Olympic slash championships there are course? There's loose requirements you have to meet, so it has to be 300 meters long and of, of a certain gradient, but... That's one of the great things about the sport, that every course you race on is really unique because no two are built exactly the same. So it means that like certain courses will have, will have a different way the water moves and will have a different way the gates are set. So it, it keeps things changing the whole time. So at this point, uh, you're almost finished. What did you say, 21 gates? Yeah. Um, you're pretty satisfied so far. It looks. Have you missed any gates so far in this? No. If you miss a gate, you've got a 50-second penalty. And then that. even if you touch a gate, it's a two-second penalty. So it's, you really want to stay. You want to stay as far away from those gates as you can. And stay safe. So, and then by this by this stage of run, your arms are in pieces. You're really feeling a <laughs> lactic burn. So, like staying off them is easier said than done. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so clearly, that's a really really good run. So, at the end there, have you missed anything? Uh, nothing, nothing. So and then the, I had one touch. It seems that if you miss a gate, you're screwed. It's like you may as well forget about game it. Game over. Yeah, especially especially at that level. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's just game over. And then what does a touch do then? How touch much? is two seconds. Two so. Seconds. You have kind of two options if you touch a gate. Like one, you can kind of stick to your plan, which we ideally do. And two is if you're aware you touched and it's early enough in the course, at times you'll kind of be like, right, that's two seconds gone. I'm going to just go for it. Okay, I see. And it, it's kind of risk versus reward. Sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. So generally you just stick to your plan. Right, okay. So that can make it more of a tactical thing than it seems at face value sometimes. We're also seeing this now. This is Slovakia. This is, this is Krakow again. This is, Sorry, this is my, uh, yeah, my second run. 
which was nearly near, a near identical run, which is something I'm looking forward to really build consistency. So talk to us about these events. I, I mentioned Slovakia there. Um, Krakow was another event. These are World Cup events. There is five World Cup events in a yeah, season. There is five World Cups spread, uh, five World Cup races spread across the whole year. So it's uh, just an accumulation of points. So it's 100 points for first, and so on and so forth as it goes down. And whoever's most points at the end wins. And we're in the middle of the World Cup spell at the moment. How are you getting on so far? Uh, not too badly. I've my results have been consistent, but not as good as I'd like. So I'm really focusing now on the World Cup final, which is coming up at the start of September. And because it's the World Cup final, it's double points. So if I get a good result there, I get double points there, and it'll bump up my standing a bit. Right, OK. And does that have any, any bearing on Olympic qualification or anything like that? It doesn't directly, because the Olympic qualification is a once-off event for us at the World Championships next year. Sure. But the World Cup final is on the same course, so it's just really good preparation that we're going to use it as like a dry run for next year for the World Championships. And that, that's in Spain, the final World Cup yeah. event? Up in the north of Spain. Up in the north of Spain. What's the place called? Liceo d'Urgell. Right, I've never heard. Is it a popular place? Is it like? It is not. Okay, right. <laughs> it's its entire population is elderly people and canoeists. Okay, and I that's see. it. So, for people who've been paddling for a long time, would you have heard of the place? It's almost like the Holy Grail, like quite a lot of the, the ski slopes would oh, be yeah. for snow sports people. Oh, yeah, 100%. Le Seigneur de is the 1992 Olympic course, so it's, right. it's, one of the, it's one of the gold standard, one of the traditional places that we go and race. And it's, it's a gorgeous setting as well, because you're surrounded by the Pyrenees Mountains. Absolutely. So, would the plan be to spend a lot of time over the course of the next few months there to almost set up camp? I know, obviously, you've got a, a few things going on with your education at the moment as well, that it might not be something you can do automatically. Yeah, like we're, we're trying to make that effectively our home course. So I want to be as good there as I am in Ireland. So we, we've done, I think, two or three trips all over already this year. And then we're going over we're going over for three weeks now for the World Cup. And then we're going to get over in the winter and all of next year. So it's, it's everything now is focused on that, that Olympic qualification. When you say we, who are you talking about? Well, me and then to whoever, whoever I'm training with. So like the, the higher group who I'm training with. And then if we can get our coach, Owen Reinish, over as well. He's, he's reputably good on that course. So it's, it's good to have him out there. Yeah, it's great that this new generation have someone like Reinish to look up to. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, he's been to, been to three Olympics, so I mean, he's the best person to get me, uh, get me to one. Yeah, like he'll have seen it up close, what is required to go really, really far in the sport. He'll have seen the very, very top performers, what the pressure is like on these occasions when the world is watching. So I presume there's been a lot of conversations that happen with him where he's almost like a, a father figure to a number of you, I'd imagine, <laughs> that he can actually give you that level of education in the sport. Oh, it's, it's absolutely, it's a universal kind of coaching that we get. That like, he's okay. not just my technical coach, that like, he does like tactical stuff and psychology stuff and nutrition. And just, he just really just sets us up to be as good an athlete and as good a paddler as we can. So it's, it's a really universal kind of education that he gives us. And how many Irish paddlers are going to be going over? Uh, there will be, at the race itself, there should be, we should have a big enough team, I'd say be about 10 of them going over across all the categories, because we only have three in each category, and Owen as well. And what's the standard like? Uh, it's, it's really on the rise. It's massively on the rise. So in K1 men, which is my class, it's getting so, so competitive. So now where there's three spots in the team, there's about six or seven guys who can make that where there used to be maybe four. And again, now everyone who goes in the team is, has potential to be competitive when we go away. Whereas there used to be a few journeymen like, who just kind of go to the races to go to the races. Right. Whereas now everyone's competitive and like everybody is like, people aren't kind of looking like, oh, it's the Irish team, sure. <laughs> They don't have rivers. Now it's, they're getting a bit kind of like, our team's kind of getting kind of quick. I want to start worrying, which is what we want. That's very interesting. What, why has that changed, that culture? Um, just through, through there, was, there was kind of a bit when Owen retired, there was a little bit of a gap that I was the only one who was a, a kind of at a good standard. And we had a bit of a gap for a while where there wasn't great standards. So we got, like, they'd see the Irish team and they'd see people racing like, oh, that's not great. Whereas now everyone's starting to come up. So they can, ju just through exposure to... Irish team just being better than we used to be. Yeah. Is there a sense that your generation now is in a position where you have to be good, you have to succeed if you want to get the recognition? Because it's very telling when you look at some of the things we've seen um, with funding and stuff over the past couple of weeks that clearly success equals more money. Like the, the hockey team, deservedly so, got, got a, a good dividend from Sport Ireland over the past couple of weeks after their unbelievable success in London at the World Cup. Do you feel that you need to achieve something on that level for the recognition and then the funding which would make your life easier to come? Kind of a, kind of a catch-22 situation. Yeah, I so well, ab absolutely. Like, so the, the better our results get, the more exposure we get, the, more, the higher profile we are. So we won't become, we're even as much in racing as we are in our sport, we're an underdog, that we're, we are a minority sport. So the better, the better our results get and the better our exposure gets, the more likely we'll be able to get that funding. 
And how is it going for you personally on a funding level? Is a lot of are you funding your own trip to, to Spain, for example, or is there a Sport Ireland fund or Canoe Ireland fund there that will help you out? There is some high performance money come to Canoeing Ireland, but it's again it's it's tied up in carding, and I'm not carded yet, so I'm entirely self funded effectively, which is mainly off the back of DIT with my scholarship there, which has been. If you'll excuse the pun, it's kept me afloat for the last <laughs> for the last few years. So that's that's what I'm living off at the moment. So getting carded can that happen before the Olympics? Yeah, absolutely. That okay. that that's entirely just dependent on your results, and they just my results just haven't been there yet. It's a year by year basis. So yeah. ultimately, at this moment in time, you don't know if you're going to be paying a lot out of your own pocket to go to Tokyo or not. If you make it to Tokyo, that is. Yeah, that's that's so, an incredible situation to be in. It's quite unique. Yeah, it's, it's you're unsure of, how, of if you'll be able to logistically go there if you make it, but presumably if you did qualify, you would get carded, you know. Yeah, I, I think the I think the carding standard is of a similar standard to where you'd have to be for qualification. Okay, but if I qualify and I was somehow outside of carding, I mean, I'd I'd sell my parents' house from under them to, <laughs> so I could go. So I'm not, and then like. Uh, with the with the profile and the exposure that would come from the qualification, I'd hopefully get more sponsors on board as well. Right. Okay. So you mentioned sponsors there. There's one very unique sponsor that I saw you had. Uh, some art gallery down yeah, the country. Yeah, uh, the Chimera Gallery in Mullingar, which is uh, run by Dave O'Shea, which was the strangest situation for getting a sponsor I've, I've ever had. I was coming back from a World Cup in 2016 through Dublin Airport. And I'm, I'm walking through with a three and a half meter racing boat because I, I fly it everywhere, and just I just hear a voice like, "Oh, is that Sam Curtis?" And I was like. I mean, minority sport. I'm not used to being recognised by anyone other than my own parents. Like, and that's <laughs> even that's not always for sure. And I was like, I just kind of went over and had a chat to him. He's like, Oh yeah, like I, I follow your stuff on social media, and I'm I'm interested in in sponsoring like a minority sport. And I'd be like, I was just trying to stay calm, be like this, whew, just play it cool. And it's like, yeah, that'd be like that'd be fantastic. And so that that's that's my only sponsor at the moment, but it's a massive help. Even that. So like, if someone would offer me fifty euro as a sponsorship, I'd take that. That's incredible. That story, like that, and I presume he's a big canoeing fan. Not massively, like he's just he's he comes from a sporting background himself, and I think he was involved in various minority sports. So he's just he's very appreciative of what we have to go through in a minority sport, and he's just through just through me keeping keeping him updated. He's just kind of aware of my progress and aware of the fact that I'm hoping to get to the Olympics. So he's just he just wants to support it, which I'm massively appreciative for. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, it's that added profile that might come from a very good finish, say in Spain, in a few weeks, perhaps, because that like even just to think of kind of a comparative situation, not in terms of sport, but in terms of the situation the sport finds itself in, when you mentioned the numerous World Cup events, I think of the situation that the modern pentathletes are in, and like we wouldn't have kind of spoken about them a lot since Rio, but this summer people were talking about them because they did really well, they medals in the World Cup events, so it's not just about the Olympics for you, I mean, in a couple of weeks' time, if, if Spain goes really well, it's, it's something where it could put you on the map a little bit, and maybe another sponsor, who knows, but again, it seems that it's, it's all out of the blue to a certain extent. Oh, like I've... I've since I've kind of been old enough to have the cop on to try. I've been I've been trying to contact companies and sponsors, but it's it's so difficult to even just get contact. So and you're doing that yourself. Yeah, that yeah. that's entirely off my own back as well. But luckily, I have some experience in kind of graphic design. So like, all, all my stuff looks good, but it's just to get the contacts. And it was just coincidentally bumping into the right person at the right time. Sure, uh, we got the breakdown this week of how that one and a half million is going to go from Shane Ross because you know he made that statement at, at the airport and uh, the hockey team, as I say, getting a half a million there, and it goes through a number of minorities sports, as you say, but Canoeing Ireland didn't get any? Not as far as I'm aware, but uh, again... Does that surprise you? Not particularly. That, again, are, it's, it is, unfortunately, it's results dependent, and we're on the rise at the moment, so our results are getting there, but they're not there yet. So we're hoping that through kind of the fact that how well we're developing and how fast we're progressing, we'll encourage a bit of that funding, but unfortunately, it's, it's very tight to results. And facilities-wise, it strikes me that the funding, funding the athletes is important, but it seems that for a legacy that there will need to be facilities funded as well, because you mentioned the artificial tracks there. Like, do we have enough in Ireland to have a generation of canoeers who can keep grow growing and growing and growing? It's, it's a difficult one, because myself, and I know some of the guys I train with, we have a mentality of, I want to prove that we can compete with the guys, with the international guys from Ireland. We want to prove that you can still do it from Ireland, but... It would it would be so much easier if we had the artificial course, which there are loose plans to do it. But even if we just had that little bit more funding to make it easier for us to travel to the UK or to continental Europe to train on the courses, would be a game changer. When you say loose plans, what are the loose plans? Uh, there's a contract up for tender for a whitewater course down at the IFSC, as far as I know, which right. is so we're like we're cautiously optimistic, but we don't want to. Uh, I won't believe it until I'm standing in front of it, looking at it. That would be amazing. 
That would it, it, again, it would be a game changer. Like, like what they would just cordon off a bit of the water from the Liffey or something, they, or like presumably, I, I don't know what they would do in that situation. It seems like a, a, an odd place to put in any sort of sporting facility. It is, but um, like if you look at the artificial course in Cardiff, it doesn't it doesn't take up a massive footprint because it okay. because they can build it as they want, so it doubles back on itself quite a bit, and most of the courses are artificially pumped as well. So once they just have a reservoir or a basin of water, they can just pump water to the top of the course. It'll flow down, and you have a whitewater course. Well, that would be unreal. I mean, that would certainly if you talk about a partic- uh, potential participation sport, if there is a course like that right in the city centre, right down in the IFSC, then like talk about it, not even inspiring a, a, a new generation, but actually enabling a new generation, which is oh, almost yeah, more like, important. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, DIT. You mentioned them there. You're on a scholarship. You've finished your degree, but you're doing your masters at the moment. Yeah, I'm just I'm ideally just finishing up my masters at the moment. I'm doing my dissertation, but I've been with DIT since 2000 and. Six no earlier again 2015 I think for a long time because as soon as I went into DIT I was on my scholarship and that was I'd gone from zero support to getting like as much support as as I could wish for at that time and it's really it's my results have improved year on year because of the support I've had because I've been well funded and well supported through through DIT. What did you study in in your undergrad? My undergrad was product design. Okay. And then I went to a master's in strategic management because I was not a fan of product design, so I wanted to do just a master's in just something else. I did not want to work in design, so I just I said I'd do something in management because that'll it just it just broadens my horizons. I can go and work elsewhere. Right. Okay. And what are you doing your dissertation on? If you don't mind me asking, I'm doing my dissertation on on knowledge transfer in coaching. So okay. I've, I've I've tried to just bring sports into it as much as I can because that's that's what my passion is. I'm not that passionate about management, but I'm passionate about sports. So I'm trying to just tie the two together. And with all that expertise you've gained in that area from your masters, how would you evaluate Owen Reinish's job in that management perspective? Oh, it depends on if he's going to see it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, like Owen, Owen, it was a strange, strange start for me, you know, because the first year he was coaching us, he was also still competing, and I was also in the senior team, so. At one race, he'd be a teammate, and then another race, he'd be my coach. But it's Owen is very, very good because as I've researched knowledge transfer, I've realised how much Owen's coaching really, really draws from like actual scientific evidence of things of like the coaching relationship rather than just him prescribing like technique and just do it this way. Just do you think you should do it this way? If you should, here's how to do it, and just facilitating me to me, me to develop rather than just instructing me. Right. Okay. That sounds really positive. Um, Sam, very best of luck with everything over the next couple of weeks. It's it's a big few weeks for you going over to Spain, but also over the next year. If we're not chatting to you before then, very best of luck. World Championships. When about next year? Are they It'll on? Be September again. Next so September. So that's game time. It's going to be great. And how much time do you expect to spend in Spain? As much as I can. So next year, I'll hopefully still be in DIT with doing a low intensity course. So I'm just going to get over there as much as I can. And we'll catch up on Skype many a time, hopefully, Perfect. before the World Championships. <laughs> Sam Curtis, thank you very much. Thank you very much.